everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I'm actually going to do something very technical today, so bear with me. There's a lot of slides. We're going to go through it pretty quickly. Um, hopefully, these slides will be available to everyone later so you can take a closer look at your leisure. So we're going to cover the transaction model that's used by CockroachDB, which is an open source database. So what are the goals? Well, we want it to be efficient in the normal case. It's actually not very efficient the way that we've built it if there's a lot of contention, but it turns out if you've done your data modeling fairly well, contention is rare in most database systems. We also want it to be correct, so um, no more playing around with these crazy SQL ANSI isolation levels like read committed and repeatable read. It's hard to even, I, I forget what they all mean exactly. Um, it defaults to serializable. We also have a snapshot isolation mode, which is sort of one step down. It permits a certain anomaly but it's very good under contention. So in order to understand the distributed transaction model, we need to cover a little bit about the distributed architecture. Cockroach has a single binary, and every node is symmetric, so they all take on the same roles. And that means that uh, each one is a gateway for clients to access the system, and each one has a distributed KV client, which it uses to talk to other nodes in the system. So logically, Cockroach is implementing just one big monolithic sorted map. This is very similar to the way that Bigtable works, and it's also how Spanner works in HBase. Um, and this is in contrast to something like Cassandra or React, which uses something called consistent hashing. There's a bi-level indexing scheme that's required in order to have this big sorted map, um, and uh, that's used for addressing. So this is a uh, diagram of a cluster. It's got four nodes. Every node has a client that's sort of locally attached to it right now. Um, so let's, let's take a certain flow of information. So in this case, the client that's connected to node one is fetching the value for key A. So that uh, goes to the gateway. The gateway then sends that to where the key A is located. In this case, it's on node two. So that value is fetched and it's returned through the KV uh, client and then through the gateway to the actual client. So here's another example. There's a client connected to node three, which is trying to put a value for B. B happens to be on node one. So this uh, looks up where this is, sends it through the, K, the distributed KV client. That sends it to node one and uh, sets the value and returns success to the client. And then this is just sort of a, a simple case. There's a client connected to node four accessing key C. Happens to be the case that C is local to node four, so that's just returned trivially. So what's in a node? We have these little circles for the nodes. Well, a node sort of corresponds to a physical machine or a virtual machine, something like an EC2 instance, for example. And each node can have any number of stores, um, usually at least one, um, but you know, in this case there's two. And stores contain segments of the larger monolithic key space. So if we actually take a look at one of those segments, we call them ranges. This is a range uh, on store two here from key N to key O. And if we actually take a look at it, you can see that there's four different values or versions for the key N. So we have an MVCC model. You can actually store multiple versions for any particular key. In this case, there's four um, different values at different timestamps. So we can actually, you know, this continues here somewhere in the middle of the range, and here's at the end of the range. So the transaction model, it's actually timestamp ordered, which means that we choose timestamps uh, to attach to transactions, and we use those when checking for things like access and, um, you know, uh, which version of a value to return. So it's also optimistic in terms of the concurrency control, which means that we wait until the end of the transaction to decide whether it succeeded and whether it needs to be restarted. And we have decentralized replicated coordinators. This is a big problem with transactions that were distributed in the past. You had this coordinator, which if it died, your system was pretty hosed and your locks would all be held. So we've really made uh, efforts to avoid those situations. And we actually, in the process of doing a transaction, all the pieces of information that we're writing that are part of the transaction are written as MVCC values. They're just the most recent value. We call them intents. They're just these provisional rights. And um, there's one additional piece, which is a transaction record. And that's where the truth about the disposition of a transaction is stored, whether it's pending, whether it's been aborted, or whether it's been committed, and at what timestamp. So here's an example of a distributed transaction, it's TXN1. It's at timestamp one nanosecond, and we're, it's a batch operation with three values that we're writing, A, B, and C. So the client sends these, it distributes through the, uh, the gateway node here. Um, so the first one is actually sending, so this transaction record which I mentioned is always co-located with the first key that's written as part of the transaction. So we're writing key A, and we're also writing this transaction record. So the blue square over there where it says A equals one at one nanosecond, the blue square in these diagrams means it's an intent, so it's one of these provisional writes. And we can see that we've added the transaction record to that node. In parallel, we're actually going to write keys B and C. 
So those values at nodes two and three, you can see they're both provisional write and tense as well. So now the next step is we commit. So this commit comes through for transaction one at one nanosecond. That gets distributed. It goes to the node which holds the transaction record. So that node now, we're moving that provisional commit or intent into a committed write. So you can see this is now green instead of blue. And we're going to return success. Notice that we're returning success to the client after we only have updated the uh, transaction record. So we don't have to go to nodes two or nodes three or you know, all the way up to nodes 150 if you had a huge distributed transaction and synchronously resolve all of those intents. The transaction record is where the truth is. So asynchronously, there's a cleanup phase where the node that contained the transaction record will asynchronously resolve the remaining intents that are part of the transaction. So this is where things get a little bit more complicated. We use a protocol called Raft, which is a distributed consensus algorithm. It's a variant of Paxos. And what it does is it provides synchronous replication for each of the ranges in the system. So every range has its own Raft instance. And Raft, in terms of you know, how, what the distributed transaction model thinks of it, is, is really this asynchronous black box. You put things into it, and you don't really know when they're going to get uh, completed, because you need to wait for a Raft consensus commit. So here's an example of Raft. So uh, there's a Raft command here, which is a batch. It includes writes to keys A, B, C, and D. Those get sent through the client uh, to the gateway. And you can see that there's this um, yellow dotted square around them. The idea behind this yellow dotted square is that these are things that are not committed yet to Raft. They're, what's, they're just in this Raft log. And, and a majority of Raft participants have to agree before it becomes committed. So the Raft leader here is sending that Raft command to its two followers, nodes two and three. As soon as the first follower is finished and can commit that, then the raft log actually becomes committed and those values are applied to the finite state machine underneath it. So we return to the client as soon as that uh, commit goes through. At some point later, of course, node three is gonna finish and also commit its data and get up, up to date as well. So we've had to introduce this concept of this piece of machinery, if you will, called the command queue. And it's because raft is asynchronous. We don't know what's gonna happen. So if you've put a write down into the system and it's in raft somewhere and it hasn't been committed yet, we can't read while that status is pending. And we also can't write without taking into consideration reads that might be underway because those reads are gonna read at a certain timestamp and we can't write underneath and rewrite history. So what the command queue does is it serializes access for overlapping commands. And uh, there's one exception, which is a read, read commands. Read, reads, it's just read only. They can proceed in parallel, even if they're overlapping. So here's an example. We have a range that goes from A to C, and we're putting four commands through. The first command is a put, the next command is a scan, then there's a get, and then there's a delete. You can see these keys are overlapping. So this is a, a pretty grim little drawing on my part here, but so we have uh, the put and the get. They can proceed in parallel because they're different keys here. The scan is actually um, predicated on that put finishing. And the delete is predicated on the scan and on the get of uh, key B. So what happens here? Well, let's say the, the put and the get are, are proceeding. The put is written in there. And this particular key, the put is completed. So now the scan is moving. So the scan is uh, reading some of the data there. The get is still pending. And of course, the delete is waiting for both of those. When the scan finishes, it's just the get. That get is taking a while for some reason. The delete is still waiting on it, behind it in this command queue. As soon as the get finishes, the delete can proceed. It writes a little tombstone down there, and uh, the command queue is now empty. So there's one more piece of machinery. It's called the timestamp cache. And the goal of the timestamp cache is to disallow history being rewritten. And what it does is it caches write-read uh, conflicts. So you do a read at a certain time, and a write comes along and wants to write at an earlier timestamp. You can't allow that. It's going to make your database inconsistent. So our timestamp cache only holds uh, a certain amount of information. We've actually limited it to 10 seconds. And the, the upshot of that is you cannot have a transaction that lasts longer than 10 seconds. So here's an example of the timestamp cache. We have a get. This get happens at uh, time 10 nanoseconds. You can see we have a little green entry there, which is read of key B at 10 nanoseconds. That's recorded in there on the range. All right, so then we have a scan which goes from A to C. This is at 11 nanoseconds. You can see we've recorded a new entry in the timestamp cache. And that pretty much supersedes the read of B at 10 nanoseconds. It's going to prevent anything from writing earlier than 11 nanoseconds. So now we have a, a put that comes along. It's trying to write something right in the middle of that scan we did. It's trying to write it at 7 nanoseconds. So at an earlier time, that would be totally illegal. It would screw up you know, the results that we were supposed to have returned. So that timestamp cache entry comes into play you know, warns the thing, hey, you, you can't do earlier than 11 nanoseconds. So that write happens at 11.1 nanoseconds. And that 0.1, uh, 
It's not actual precision in the nanoseconds. It's, this, it's just a shorthand in these diagrams for a logical part of the time stamp that we use. So there are three different kinds of transaction conflicts that we're paying attention to here. There's read-write ones. This is where um, a write needs to push an existing transaction forward in time um, because a, uh, it's some, someone's trying to read something and there's a, a write there and that write that's there has to be moved forward so the read can happen underneath it. Then you have a read-write and this is where the timestamp cache comes into play. And, and, and the only thing to do in that case is you have to move the, tra the writing transactions timestamp forward because it can't rewrite history. And there's two different things that happen depending on the isolation level. I mentioned there's two isolation levels that we support. If it's snapshot isolation, then you can always commit at a higher timestamp. If it's serializable isolation, then you have to retry the entire transaction at the higher timestamp. So you have to reread everything at that higher timestamp. And there's also write-write conflicts. And in these cases, one transaction has to import the other in order to make forward progress. So here's an example of a read-write conflict. You can see down in node one, we have a write intent there in that blue box, which is at two nanoseconds. We're trying to read right now at three nanoseconds. So that read goes through the client, hits the gateway, gets sent over, and the read finds that it's trying to read at three nanoseconds, but there's an earlier write which is pending, right? And that's at two nanoseconds. So that pending write is gonna force the reader to do something, and in this case what it does is it pushes the transaction forward. So it actually moves that uh, write intent from two nanoseconds, you can see it's moving it one logical tick past the read timestamp, which is three, so it's A equals two at 3.1 nanoseconds, and it's also moving the transaction record forward. And then of course is returning the value of A at one nanosecond, which is the uh, earliest version that's, uh, that's uh, not pending. So here's an example of a write-read conflict. In this case, you can see down at node one, we have an entry in the read timestamp cache at two nanoseconds. But here, we're trying to write that same key at one nanosecond. So we're trying to rewrite history, which of course isn't allowed. So this uh, command for the put comes through, gets sent over to the node, and then what happens is the, the write has to occur after that read timestamp entry. So the write actually occurs at 2.1 nanoseconds, and that's returned up to the client. Now here's the case where isolation equals snapshot. When we go to commit here, it's okay, right? Because with snapshot, you're able to commit at a, a forward timestamp. So this actually just succeeds pretty trivially. On the other hand, if isolation is serializable, when that commit command comes down and actually gets to that node and discovers that its transaction timestamp has been moved forward, it's gonna generate a retry error command that's sent back to the client. So finally, a write-write conflict. Here we've got two transactions. The first transaction is trying to put a value at one nanosecond goes down there, writes the commit or the uh, intent entry for A equals one at one nanosecond, sets its transaction record. Then the second transaction comes along, tries to do the same thing. When it gets down to node one and sees that existing write intent, it actually has to abort it. So what it does is it sets the transaction one's status to aborted, writes its own transaction record, transaction two, and writes its own commit while deleting the old commit, or uh, writes its own intent while deleting the old intent uh, for A equals two at two nanoseconds. And then, of course, uh, when transaction one comes back and attempts to commit, it's going to get down to that node and discover that it's been aborted, which will propagate a transaction restart message to the client. So transaction histories are, are sort of how we talk about transactions and the different things that can happen and p potentially you know, describe what might go wrong. So they really describe each of the operations in a transaction. And you know, the things that we're, we're going to use here, we have a simple read command of, of any key, there's a write. There's increment, which is a shorthand for a write plus one. There's a scan, which is over a key range, and there's a delete range over a key range. And of course, we have commit. So what are transaction anomalies? They're the things that can happen when you don't have concurrency control or you don't have very good concurrency control. And really, the prevention of anomalies is what gives you the A and the I in acid. So atomicity, everything happens or nothing happens, or isolation, which is the fiction that you're using a multi-tenant database as its only user, at least in a batch sort of serializable fashion. And the stronger your isolation is, the fewer anomalies you have, and you ideally want none. So this is an example of an anomaly. It's called inconsistent analysis, also known as dirty read. And you can see we have transaction one that kind of goes horizontally across the top and transaction two horizontally across the bottom. And transaction one is reading and committing and transaction two is reading and writing and committing. And they're writing the same keys and reading the same keys. With inconsistent analysis, you're actually able to see values that have been written by that uh, transaction two in transaction one. So you start reading A and then some later point you read B 
and you may, you may get different values. You clearly either want all zeros or you want all ones in this case, but it's possible you'll get uh, uh, one and zero instead. So lost update is an example where two transactions are both trying to increment a key and they sort of stomp on each other. So one, can, one sort of uh, overwrites the other's progress. Um, there's another one called phantom read. This has to do with ranges of information. Um, you know, this is something that wasn't clear to people that was an anomaly for quite some time. And then, uh, you know, given, you know, certain progress, this became something that had to be addressed. Um, in this case, you have that top transaction. It's doing two scans and a commit. So there's two scans in the same transaction. It has to read the same thing both times it does the scan. Um, there's the other transaction which is uh, interleaved with it, which is just incrementing a key. When you have phantom read, you can actually read different things with the two different um, successive scans. Phantom delete is very similar, except for you delete in the transaction a range, and then you read in the same transaction a range. So clearly it should be absolutely empty, um, but if you have phantom delete, uh, this magical thing will pop up on you. And then write skew. Now this is the one that is the only one that's actually relevant for cockroach because the difference between serializable and snapshot allows this write skew anomaly. So um, in the write skew, you have two different transactions. They're reading the same information, but one transaction writes one key and the other transaction writes a disjoint key. So they write different places, but they read the same. And you can end up with a problem. So we can actually talk about how we test the model in cockroach. So what we do is we take those transaction histories and we permute them in every possible way. We also, there's a concept which I'm not covering in this talk called priority, and of course the isolation level, which I've mentioned. And so with right skew, we have this, you know, these two simple transaction histories. When you permute them, you get you know, a, a quite a big list here. It's like 20 of them. And then when you do isolation and priority, you get something like 80 every time we run this particular unit test. So here's sort of an example of uh, that right skew. In this case, we um, are putting two values, so we're setting the initial values for A and B. We're setting them both to 100 at one nanosecond. We've seen this before, you know, thing comes down to node one. We set A equals 100, and then we propagate that to raft. Great, we send the re results back. So now, this is transaction one, so the first part where we scan A to C here. We're gonna get the values of A and B. That goes through the gateway node. We fetch those two values. You can see down at node one and at node two, we've set the timestamp cache we're reading at two there for the value. We return A equals 100 and B equals 100, just as we expect. So on the next, next step is transaction two. It's the next thing in the history here. It's doing the exact same thing. You can see the differences here. It's actually at operating at transaction, uh, at timestamp three nanoseconds. So it actually adds its own timestamp entries for R at three and R at three at nodes one and two. And again, it's also returning A equals 100 and B equals 100. So now transaction one goes to write. And it's going to take the values that read for A and B, which is 100 and 100, add one. So it's going to write 201. It's doing this at timestamp two nanoseconds. So that goes down, gets sent over to node one. And at node one, we discover that there's a read timestamp cache entry at three nanoseconds. We're trying to write at two. We can't do that. So we actually have to move forwards. We do it at 3.1 nanoseconds. And of course, Raft propagates that uh, value across. So when we go to commit, since it's serializable, when that message gets down to node one to commit, we see that our transaction is at two and we're supposed to be committing at 3.1. We can't do that, so it sends retry. This particular history is going to fail. It's gonna to have to retry on that one. So meanwhile, the second transaction is able to continue. It actually does the same thing. It's writing value 201, but at three nanoseconds this time. It gets to node two. Um, it is actually able to write this um, value. It gets to the commit stage. And of course, it's writing at three it's transaction records at three, there's no problem. It can go ahead. So you can see those blue intents have been moved into committed greens and it succeeds. So now transaction one, it was informed that it had a retry. Now it's retrying at 3.1 nanoseconds. So now things kind of work as you'd expect. And in this case, you're reading the values. Um, it adds new timestamp cache entries at 3.1, but returns the values. And this time it's A equals 100, as you'd expect, but it's getting the newest value of B. Right? So B is gonna equal 201. So now when you put it, you're gonna actually write 302 to the value. It goes down there, writes it on the commit. Things work as you'd expect. Raft propagates it. The values are um, you know, properly committed and we return success. Now if we get A and we get B, we get the values A equals 302 and B equals 201. So it's the correct values. So the summary, um, you know, it's a distributed architecture. We have clients that talk to uh, symmetric nodes which contain gateways and distributed key value clients. Then we have the node components. Nodes contain stores, stores have ranges, 
ranges are replicated with Raft, MVCC to hold multiple versions of values. Raft does synchronous replication. We have a command queue, which orders things by dependencies. There's a timestamp cache, which avoids us rewriting history. And then the transaction model itself is composed of intents, which are the little sort of provisional writes, part of the undo log, really. Then you have a transaction record, which is a single source of truth. This fast second phase, where you only update the transaction record, you don't have to do a synchronous round to all the participants. And then there's asynchronous cleanup. And we have two isolation levels, which are snapshot, which is a, a little bit better with contention. And we have serializable, which is really the strongest one. Thank you.